Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name's Tim. I'll be your cameraman tonight, possibly helping moderating. Andy Anderson will be also collecting our fees tonight. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. The first, we have some brief announcements. The second, we'll have our presenter present his findings and his research and his speech. The third will be our question and answer period, where we would love you to ask questions, but not give a speech or a statement, because you will, after the question period, have a chance to rebut the speaker, usually four to six minutes or thereabouts, depending on the amount of speakers at the time. We have to be out of the, out of the restaurant at Devers East, here in Chicago, at uh, 8.45, so we will continue to work until then. Without further ado, let's welcome <coughs> Brother Joe and an update on the UBS contract. Hey, hey, Get the fuel going. In 1997, the International Brotherhood of Teamsters struck UPS and won. It was the greatest labor victory of the decade, at the very least. It was like when Muhammad Ali beat Sonny Liston. We shocked the world. What's my name, fool? Brother Joe, 705, retired Teamster, straight out of UPS. So, uh, yeah, so I'm here. I'm a little bit long. Okay. All right, that was a little introduction, so that was a little extra energy there. Okay. So, uh, okay, so now I come here to speak about the UPS contract. Can anybody hear me just fine? Yes. Yeah, okay, it doesn't sound so loud right now. Okay. All right, great. So I come here to speak about the, uh, the UPS contract. It's the largest uh, private uh, sector union contract in the United States and it's expiring um, July 31st. Okay, but uh, we got to backtrack and give you a little history to know, know where, you know, where we're at now. So back in 97, you know, it was an undisputed victory, right? And uh, now how did we do it? Well, we had, we had a kind of leader that mobilized the membership. You know, we had an escal you know, an escalating contract campaign, preparing to strike if necessary, and when it was necessary, when UPS gave their last, best, and final offer, you can watch the video, that's how the guy talks, last, best, and final offer, so we struck UPS and won. You know, and, uh, you know how did we do it? It wasn't magic, you know, it wasn't luck. No, it uh, wasn't rocket science. It was that escalating contract campaign. That was the key. That was the key. And uh, so, how it broke down is uh, we had a you know we went out and surveyed the members to find out what they want. We had a petition. And when we had these petitions, right, is it's giving people's phone numbers, it's giving people's emails, so you can update the, the members about what's going on with the contract. Keep the members informed. Unlike now how we have uh, information brownout, we use the term brownout as UPS. Okay, in, in this escalation campaign, we have stickers, you know, uh, t-shirts, over here, one of the t-shirts. I think this is might have been from the 97 contract campaign. It's a, it's a look uh, from our local though. It's a, we're asking Brown for a little bit of green. Uh, Teamsters Local 705. Uh, and this was back when uh, Jerry Zero was Secretary of Treasury. You know, and this ain't something I write about in the book. You know, there's some good books out there, but you know, this is a well-worn shirt that was worn to work for a long time. I got, you know, got my use out of it. So, and then you know, we have parking lot rallies, right? And then we had a strike authorization vote. And we had 95% strike authorization vote. And once again, you know, then we went out when they had that last, best, and final offer. You know, we went out and struck. You know, and so to do that, to, during this thing, we built you know membership unity right through this contract campaign. You know, and then we had the solidarity of other unions at UPS. You know, because there's other unions there. Their mechanics have a union. The pilots have a union, so they supported us. And we built, you know, we got support of the rest of the labor movement. You know, the AFL-CIO supported the strike. And, you know, the Teamsters have an on-again 
off to get in a relationship with the Teamsters because the Teamsters, you know, do their own thing sometimes, right? And uh, we also got the support of the customers, right? We reached out to the customers and asked, you know, the package car drivers went out to the customers and asked them not to accept UPS packages during the strike. Okay, we won the support of the public. So uh, we were having press conferences, you know, and uh, we won the messaging. Basically, it was like part-time America, right? Part-time America won't work. We're fighting for full-time jobs for all Americans. So this message resonated with over 70% of the American public, right? So then that gave us the political support we needed. Now, I'm not as big a fan of Clinton as neoliberalism and NAFTA and all that nonsense, but but he's a political opportunist. And he know which way the wind was blowing. So when UPS, you know, asked for an injunction, he, you know, the best thing that Clinton ever did was a non-action, that he didn't get involved in the UPS strike. And basically, after UPS's last best and final offer, you know, you gotta see the video, you watch the video of the 97 strike, he's hilarious. So, you know, you know, the Lev's offer, they, they caved like a house of cars, you know, basically after a couple weeks. Okay, and, uh, and oh, we had some militancy. I don't want to forget about that. There was some militancy uh, during the campaign. Okay, so you know, there was rank and file members, you know, on the line doing their militant thing. You know, I was uh, walking the picket line, you know, in front of the building, you know, where the scabs are trying to come in, right? Management scab, you know, because we didn't have but one person across the picket line. I go into that. So I was, you know, in front of the gate when the truck was coming in, walking real slow like this, you know. Good. I was keeping it moving, you know, but even when I kept it moving, they called the police on me. So, you know, I left one way, the cops came the other way. I came back with a stocking on my head. You know, the strike captain said I couldn't, couldn't do all that. But uh, there was some real militant stuff going on, like, uh, you know, in solidarity, militancy and solidarity. So, you know, these uh, scab, management scab was driving these package cars, right? And they were parking in the uh, garages, you know, downtown when they were trying to deliver. Well. Uh, you know, an act of solidarity, uh, the IBEW had to uh, do some maintenance on the cameras in the parking garage. I have more water. So when the, uh, when the cameras were turned off, uh, the UPS trucks got their tires slashed and the radiators punctured. <laughs> and on other occasions, you know, uh, there was big cars, you know, big traffic jams in front of the exits from the parking garages. So whenever things said and done, you know, the, the key though is building the member solidarity and expanding from there. So uh, we won, you know, and it was, it was a, you know, a great victory for the labor movement. It, you know, it inspired others as well, you know, but uh, yeah, so, and what, what did we get? What did we win in this strike? Well, we won the largest pay increase, you know, in, at UPS, and, you know, up until that time. And we got extra, uh, uh, extra dollar an hour for the uh, part-timers for catch-up pay because there was a big gap between the part-time and the full-time pay. So a dollar catch-up pay closed the gap a little bit, right? Well, we won a 50 cent increase in the starting pay, moving from $8 an hour to $8.50. And that was worth a lot more, uh, you know, back then than it is today, you know, over tw uh, 20 years ago. And uh, we won an extra half an hour guarantee for the part-timers. The part-timers were only guaranteed three hours. And then, so they got three and a half hours in the table from 15 to 17 and a half hours. And we also won uh, 10,000 full-time jobs around the country over the length of the contract. It's supposed to be 2,000 every year. And we stopped UPS from pulling out the pensions. So, I mean, it was, it was a great victory, right? But the thing is, like I said before, we had a kind of leader that mobilized the membership. And, you know, uh, so then that leader, Ron Carey, was uh, basically uh, kicked out of the union for some bogus charges that he was found not guilty of later. But the effect was, uh, you know, a junior Hogfoot came in, you know, the son of infamous Jimmy Hoffa, right? And there's this uh, saying about the apple doesn't far from, fall far from the tree, but in this case, it fell from the tree, rolled down the hill, and went into the gut, yeah. you know, you know, I'm not saying uh, Hoffa Sr. was perfect, because I got some critiques of him too, that would be a whole other speech. But he wasn't, no, wasn't a punk at least, you know. This guy, this guy uh, Jr., he didn't work a hard day's work in his life. He was a corporate lawyer, you know, and he came in under his father's name. So, you know, he doesn't have the heart, the intestinal fortitude, you know, to lead the Teamsters. 
you know, he's a uh, class collaborator, and some could even say he's a class trader. So anyway, so he came in, right? And uh, so now, UPS doesn't want to fulfill the 10,000 jobs we want on the picket line. You know, you know, when there's a contract, you know, the company has no intention to hold, hold you know, to follow the contract. But a contract is a moment in time, you know, between the strength of the company and the union. And then, you know, the company ain't going to want to, you know, abide by the contract. And they're going to push it their way. And the union should be pushing it, you know, to have, you know, their, their way, you know what I mean, for the way for the workers. You know, it's basically a living document because sometimes there will be ambiguous language in there that neither side can agree on and it's settled on the shop floor and then through arbitration and so on and so forth as it goes on. So anyway, we, we had all these victories, but now we have a different kind of leadership. That's why it's very important to have union democracy and have the members more involved and have bottom-up organizing instead of top-down. Okay, so now, um, you know, uh, so while this is going on, UPS is really mad that, you know, they had to eventually give them uh, full-time, uh, you know, the full-time jobs. You know, um, I got my uh, full-time job in 2001 based on uh, my seniority, right? And, but management, you know, resented those jobs and, you know, harassment was at an all-time high. So I'd be fighting the company, standing up for myself, my brothers and sisters, you know, maybe not doing it the exact right way and get myself disciplined. You know, UPS trying to fire me, so, you know, my, my wife found these labor classes, I'm divorced now, but, but, you know, she used to say, everything happens for a reason, I don't really believe that, but if the reason for us was getting married, to find these labor classes, you know, that was, you know, that became my passion in, my, in life, you know, I got a basic and advanced certificate in labor studies, right, so then the next contract comes along. Right, so we see, you know, we see the, you know, the misleadership of Hoffa. You know, the contract is, you know, to be argued that it's concessionary, the 2002 contract. Right, uh, we don't get an increase in the starting pay. Uh, we don't get any increase in the, uh, in the, uh, the uh, guaranteed hours for part time. You know, it's a relatively concessionary contract. You know, it ain't keeping up with inflation. So, you know, and the harassment and harassment keeps on going at UPS and it keeps on escalating, right? So, uh, so what I'm one, you know, I mean, UPS can be real petty, you know, and, you know, always fighting them. But this is one, one of my favorite uh, stories to share about uh, what, we, uh, what we did to fight back at UPS, you know, uh, direct action. So we're working there in the sort out, right? And uh, we got the radio playing. It's not even music I like, right? But uh, they, they want to shut, it, shut the radio off on us. You know, just, you know, just being petty and harassing us. We don't have nothing in the contract that, you know, says we can have a radio inside the building or whatever. You know, we could go with past practice, file through the grievance procedure, that could take forever. So they shut off the radio. You know, uh, so yeah, uh, I started singing, we shall overcome. You know, everybody started singing, right? Everybody started singing along. So the management started hollering at us, you know, to shut up down there, blah, blah, blah. So, but we were working, right? We didn't stop working, and we kept on singing, right? And, and the steward at the time hollered back up at management, saying we got the right to free speech. So, you know, uh, so we're singing, and we shall overcome. And, you know, we're out of tune, out of key, but it's the best music I ever heard in my life. Management wanted to turn back the radio on. That was direct action. It got the goods. You know, it matters, you know, if, if it's something that matters to members, it might, not, you know, not be, you know, wages, might not be benefits, but that was our working conditions, and we fought back, and we won. And there's other stories, you know, where, you know, um, we got people involved, you know, to use the grievance procedure and so on and so forth, but you know, that, was, that was one of the ones that, you know, warmed my heart, right? So, uh, you know, shortly thereafter, you know, I was appointed as a union steward, and, you know, so, you um, Right, so then the next contract comes up, and uh, this contract is even more concessionary. It's no doubt, you know, a very concessionary contract. The raises are smaller than the previous contract. The previous contract had like 83 and a half cent raises per year average. This one is 80 cents. Now, that might not sound like a big deal, but each contract the raises should be bigger because of inflation. They shouldn't be less. So even if the raises were the same, I would you know, say it's a concessionary contract, you know. I mean, I'm unequivocally for the you know, working class. So, you know, and um, they also, once you go full-time, 
they have a wage progression that takes a certain amount of time, right? So in this contract, they, they moved it from, from two and a half years to three years. So after you waited a long time to go full time, they have a th three year progression to get up the full time pay. Uh, I think this may have been the contract when uh, they took away uh, the health care, you know, for the people who just got hired. Initially, when you, when you first got in, you know, it was like your seniority. You have your seniority, your 40 days, whatever it is, you get the health care. Now it's a one year to get your benefits. So, I mean, each contract is more concessionary. So, I'm organizing a vote no contract, but, but I'm an appointed steward. So, so then, uh, so the business agent comes up to me, you know, um, and he, he, he brings the chief steward with him because the, the business agent kind of looked like Mr. Roper from Three's Company. You know? And uh, so he brought, he brought the chief steward with him. And he, he's like a biker and he thinks he's some kind of tough guy. So we got the, the, the business agent, uh, Larry Keller, and the uh, chief steward, Dean Cerna. You know, and they come up to me and ask me if uh, I want to resign from being the union steward. And I said, like, no, I wasn't really thinking about all that. And uh, so then, you know, he told me I was removed, you know, and, you know, and I'm not a steward anymore. And, you know, so then, you know, a little time goes by, I'm calling you all the people, my other teams and brothers, and, hey, yeah, you tell people what happened. They said, yeah, they've done that stuff to people before. So I called the union hall, talked to the principal officer. I wasn't removed as steward, you know. So then, I, you know, I'm telling UPS I'm still a steward. They don't want to listen to me. They have to wait until the business agent gets in there and straightens it out. Now, I could have filed internal union charges against him because he didn't have the authority to remove me, but you know, I need his backing and those to support the members. But this kind of gave me you know, a taste. You know, first, okay, I found out the international is kind of bogus, you know. But I mean, when, I, when that strike, when that 97 strike, that woke me up to the labor movement. That gave me class consciousness, showed how we could struggle, we could fight back and win, you know. But then, you know, we got these, uh, you know, these uh, people in office that are opportunists at best, you know. But then our local, you know, was was fighting. We were fighting for a little bit more in a 2000 contract. We had a little bit more than the national. So then I find out, you know, our local, you know, is, some of the local leadership is, you know, kind of full of nonsense to put it nicely. And then you know, I found a reform organization. You know, and I learned so much from this reform organization. But you, as you can expect, you know, I'm gonna have the same same issues with them down the road. But uh. Anyhow, so uh, so next, you know, this contract goes through, right? Um, so, but uh, 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 the next, and by the time the next contract comes through, you know, I'm a, uh, elected union steward, so I'm not in a position, you know, to be removed either, you know, even by the principal office, right? And we can see this contract, you know, from the past history, right? One concessionary contract after another. I mean, you, by, by now you can understand. You don't you don't vote no on the first offer, right? I mean, you don't vote no. You I mean, you don't accept the first offer, right? When you're selling your car, you don't accept the first offer when you're selling your house. You shouldn't sell, uh, accept the first offer when you're selling your labor. I think that's how, worth a lot more than you know any any kind of you know physical object, but your labor, you know, your life's blood, your life's energy, your time, your life. That's what you're selling, right? Your time and your life. So anyhow, so the next country comes up, you know, it's even more concessionary, right? And uh, so the raises are once again are smaller. It amounts to 78 cents per year, the contract on average. Uh, they want a four-year four progression for the drivers. Right, and, and uh, then also we have uh, concessions on our health care. Now, and this is all you know the 2013 contract. But, you know we're organizing more than a year before the contract. You know that's what we learned we got to do. But it's because of the, the Obama health care bill. Uh, the Obama health care bill. What it did is gave you know it was a dividing conquer bill, it providing crappy health care for. The poor working class people that can't afford to use it with high co-pays and deductibles. And it gave, you know, uh, the working class uh, people that are a little bit better off and, you know, the petty bourgeoisie, you know, have to purchase the health insurance or be fine, right? And then they're, they're mad at the people who get a little some sum for free because in this society they control the blame game. They, they, they always got to blame the person who got a little bit less than you, right? And then for the union folk, it had the benefit of lowering our health care benefits. But nobody cares about us. 
because our benefits are still better than most people, even with the reduction. But who can, who's benefiting from this? It's the, the for-profit insurance companies who are getting billions of new customers. Some people have to buy it. You know, some of the other people have to uh, subsidize it for the, the poorer individuals. So it's this divide, divide and conquer health care bill, right? And it, was, and it was supported by the te International Teamsters. Now, now UPS wanted to get out of this health care plan because of the 40% tax on premium plans. They didn't want to get hit with this 40% tax, right? That was coming down the road possibly. My understanding is still in here, but it's that threat. Now, the Teamsters, one of their biggest employer in paying their health and welfare fund, right? So their plan was basically, you know, to get the biggest employer paying it, and they'll just cut the benefits to lower the lower the, the whatever the premium plan will be. Okay, so I mean, this was the biggest issue, you know, uh, for the Teamster members. You know, this fired everybody up, and there was a contract campaign organized by rank and file members all around the country. You know, I did my thing in the Chicagoland area. There's people all around the country, you know, I mean, it was strong in New York, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, you know, out in Washington State, you know, other places too, but so all over this country, uh, all over the country, they were uh, organizing against uh, this uh, team care health bill, health care bill. All right, so that was going on. Uh, 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 this health care bill. And uh, the Teamster officials, Ken Hall, basically said, you know, you're not paying $90, you're not paying $9, you ain't paying nine cents for your health care. Well, uh, what, what, you know, it was disingenuous at best. He meant we weren't paying a premium. But well, the, the facts of the matter was the out of pocket costs would be going up for members, you know, like for, uh, set for, for like glasses, you know. I still got, you know, two pairs of my glasses uh, back before I, before I retired. The other one is kind of like sports-looking glasses. I should have brought those today. They look pretty cool. But I didn't pay anything for them. Now it's, it's a minimum of 50 bucks getting out the door when you get your glasses. Uh, you know, another, another thing is, you know, in the last year of the contract is either of deductibles and co-pays that we didn't have before, but they always push it off. Well, it's in the last year to contract, it ain't that much. But every contract will go up. Uh, but one of the big things was the one punch rule. You know, this, this is a little complicated, so I gotta get a, a little uh, explanation, but one punch rule is previously, you had to punch in once a month for your health care. It, it was on a monthly basis. You know, one day or work. Now, and they changed the rule, they have to punch in once a week. Now that may not sound like much, but like say if you're a package car driver and you're a new package car driver, you get laid off, you lose your health insurance. You know, I mean, there's some other situations where, you know, you know at UPS they'll ask uh, people if they want to go home. So, you know, they just worked a few minutes, they'll go home. And, you know, and it's, it's somebody I know, I mean, maybe not a lot of people, but, you know, they did this every day of a, a whole week. What management did is fudge the time clock, and you know, put put in the time clock. They didn't work any time at all, and then you know, say it hey, will add it to your next week. But what they did is got got out of paying the health and welfare plan for you know health health insurance payments for that week, you know. And if nobody went to the doctor, you know, uh, nobody would be the wiser, right? And the, and the teamsters wouldn't get you no know, payment from the health care fund. What what happened was you know if somebody had to go to get health and you know get a uh, medical treatment, you know, that would affect them. Oh, and a little more uh, explanation about the team care that I, I should put in. You know, now, I don't know how many people are familiar with the difference between uh, pensions and 401ks, but our health care system, you know, is, was very similar to that. When we had health care uh, provided by UPS, UPS then provided out of the kindness of the heart, we negotiated, we negotiated a certain set of benefits from the UPS. We negotiated these benefits, and UPS was self-insured, so they had to cover those benefits, no matter the cost. We had to define benefits, right? But then, when the Teamsters took it over, we had defined contributions. We negotiated a certain amount of money that UPS would con contribute, and, and that would be it, right? And then we get our benefits from the Teamsters. So anyhow, so there was this organized vote no campaign around the country. 
You know, um, the contract barely passed, but over 18 supplements got voted down. So the way the, uh, the Constitution is, the contract can't take effect until all the supplements pass. <coughs> so, you know, then they had, so they had to have a national health care meeting, right? So this national health care meeting was only supposed to be for, you know, the executive board, you know, the union officials. What they have is these two-man meetings. You know, two people from each local, you know, that, that um, is, is at UPS, you know, for, for this particular meeting. We have two-man two contract meetings. So I got wind of this. So I call up the hotel. These rooms are only supposed to be set aside for Teamster officials, but I reserve a room, you know, because I'm a Teamster and I got the room. You know, and I go up there with my crew, you know, go into this uh, health care meeting. I get all the material, you know, all the, the flyers, because they don't, you know, they, they distribute this information, right, and they don't pass it on to the membership. They keep it, you know, like a brownout is what we call it. You know, I got the DVDs, I got all the information, you know, so I, then I can distribute. And at this meeting, they made improvements to the health care be, because these 18 supplements were voted down. Now, they didn't frame it that way. They said because they got more people into the health care, they can improve the benefits somewhat. They didn't negotiate more money from UPS. They just spent more money that they already had as a this health and welfare fund. You know, and then Ken Hall went on, they, he didn't understand why, blah, blah, blah. You know, so, and at this meeting, you know, I had my crew there, but so then uh, some uh, uh, local leader, you know, that's a hog officer. That's what we call officers that support hog, 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 hog officers. You know, we have a little pejorative, we have a little fun, fun with it and everything. Thanks. But, uh, so anyhow, at this meeting, you know, I got beef with this local, uh, this official from uh, the West Coast that I've been beefing with. You know, and uh, he has his, uh, you know, thugs there or whatever, but, you know, it's like, you know, they're not gangster, you know, they're just gangster wannabes and the old gangster wannabes anyway. So anyway. So yeah, we was uh, beefing a little bit in the, uh, the bar, you know, and the bar asked us if we could step away, but they gave us a bunch of drinks and they got all mad and we got free drinks and, you know, and they almost got thrown out themselves, you know, because of that. So anyhow, so, so they made some improvements to the health insurance, you know, and, and multiple things are going on at the same time, right? So while, while this whole con contract thing was going on, you know, a year prior, over a year prior, you know, there's social media, you know, people are getting out on, you know, all kinds of social media, Facebook. There's the one big one, you know, that this one guy got out uh, out in New Jersey area as a vote no on the UPS contract. You know, it, it's still going strong, you know, it's, you know, like 14 some thousand, 15, I don't know, you know, thousands of people on it. You know, we allegedly have a couple hundred thousand teamsters at UPS, but still it's, it's a good way to get out the message to the people, you know, and not uh, everything. But, uh, you know, I mean, I'm on the social media doing a thing, too, you know, the year prior. But, you know, the big thing is getting out of these uh, facilities. So I can, you know, break it down for you how uh, the UPS works. You know, at UPS, the package car, there's package car drivers, right? They start at, usually leave out of there at 8.30 in the morning. And they come back anywhere from 9 and a half, you know, to 12 hours later or whatever, something like that. And then there's a shift that's four hours before, you know, what they do is unload the, <coughs> unload the trailers, put them in the package cars, right? And then after the shift is done, after you, you know, you know uh, the package car drivers come out, there's an opposite shift. So that the people unload the package cars, right? And then they go out in the trailers to leave. And that's most, most facilities <coughs> operated like that. Most of the package centers are the bigger ones, but most of them are like that. So what I would do, I, I had six, seven weeks of vacation. So I would travel. Okay, just to give you the logistics, 710 was negotiating their contract first. You know, like I said, uh, in 2008, they got a meet, 710 got a meet to agreement, whatever 705 got, they got, right? That's more than the, the national, but I didn't say that already. And so uh, 705, you know, the way they frame it is they were negotiating for 710 too, if they knew that, blah, blah, blah. See, the way they're looking at it, a lot of union officials, they're looking that the employer is only going to give them so much money. So then they do a um, you know, uh, dog and pony show, and the Teamsters we call a dog and horse show, Teamster horse. So they do this show, but what they're really doing is just you know, having a show, and you know, they only get a certain much money, and they kind of try to figure out how much you know, goes for this, that, or another. What we need to do is you know, 
have an escalating contract campaign, putting pressure on the companies to get a bigger slice of that pie instead of letting you, the company decide how much money is and then we divide it up, you know. So anyhow, right. So, so uh, yeah, so I'm going to all the UPS facilities, right. Um, first 705, i have given uh, 705 uh, jurisdiction. It's the Chicagoland area. So it's, uh, you know, basically Harvey, Bedford Park, uh, or catch, uh, it catch uh, Hodgkin's UPS. It's the biggest ground facility in the country right off of 294. You can see the monument from there. Westmont, Franklin Park, Addison, um, Palatine, Northbrook, O'Hare Airport, and Jefferson. That's the one inside the city at 14th and Jeff Street. And the rest, in 710, is all of them outside of uh, that area, northern Illinois, the northern half of Illinois and northern half of Indiana. So I'd be traveling on my vacations Catching, you know, getting a preload, you know, three something in the morning before a preload would start, you know, um, you know, flyering, petitioning, having these one-on-one -on -one conversations with people, right? Then I would head out to the next facility, be at the next facility a couple hours later when they're on break. You know, maybe I only catch the smokers whoever goes outside, but I catch them at break, you know, do the same thing. Then I leave, this is the biggest one of the day usually, I catch a preload finishing and the package cars driver starting. This shift is called the pre the preload is the shift that was before the drivers go out. So anyhow, I catch the drivers coming in and the, uh, the uh, preload finishing. And then, you know, I, I'd go maybe uh, go sleep at a rest stop or get a fly-by-night hotel or whatever. Then I go to another UPS facility and catch catch the drivers finishing for the day. In the twi twilight, we call it reload where I'm at, but twilight reload, catch them. Uh, starting for the night to unload the package cars and then I drive to another one and catch you know catch them on their break and I go on to the next one you catch the uh, you know twilight reload finishing you know and I start over the next day this is what I would do on my vacations you know you know agitating um, educating agitating and organizing you know in doing this you know you know I, I met good crews of people you know um, you know and, and build up you know a group of people and then we'd meet, you know, off UPS property, you know, and I'd give them the tools to organize the vote no on their contract, you know, inside campaign, you know, so they can get people's names and phone numbers, one-on-one -on -one conversations, you know, we could put signs in the vehicles, you know, in the parking lots, you know, I gave them, you know, management, you know, let them know management's going to, you know, go, go at them, so let them know that they, they can only do this in uh, non-work areas and non-work times, and so on and so forth. So, you know, I mean, I did the most to make this happen. You know, I took my own horn. Some people don't like that too much. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I couldn't, you know, but the people were, had to be ready to hear the message. They were sick and tired of their corrupt leadership. Uh, the union officials, you know, the hog officers, uh, got busted for embezzling $50,000 worth of gift cards. You know, uh, Mike Flynn, you know, his cohort, Sweeney, and all them people. So, you know, they were ready to hear this message, right? They were ready to stand up and fight back. They didn't know, though, they were going from into the frying pan, into the fire, because who took it over? You know, when the, the in their local one in trusteeship was uh, E. Coli. That's my little pejorative for him, John Coley. He's a son of a gangster. I mean, his father was, was a made man. That's, you know, a fact. I'm not saying he's a made man, he's maybe a wannabe gangster and a corrupt official, but he, he looked like Tony Soprano, but only bigger and uglier. Uh, if you watch The Sopranos, he had an idiot kid just like Tony Soprano did. He put him in, you know, put him in as an officer. And uh, eventually uh, he, he uh, got kicked out of the union and extortion charges. And hopefully, you know, he may be facing, you know, 20 some years in jail, but he was the most powerful teamster in the Chicagoland area. But anyway, I digress. There's like so many different stories that go on and, and so, so many tangents that can go on. But going back to the, uh, the 710, right? So in 710, they voted no, on the con voted no on the contract. And what did they get? Well, and they got it and 705 got it. An extra five hours in the part-time vacation. Because all the vacations pay out at 20 hours, except for the optional week that pays out at 25. So this is the last year of the contract right now. And they get paid 25 hours. It costs UPS five million dollars. Okay, so um, what did what did UPS do? You know, uh, people ran vote no campaigns around the country, right? 
So when all this was done, they retaliated against people all around the country. But, but anyhow, I'll get more on that a little bit later. But uh, so anyway, so then you know we had this vote no, right? You know, and that was that was the kind of the gist of it uh, in 710. There was vote no's all around the country, right? And uh, you know, and uh, so they had you know they had the second vote, and you know more of them passed, but there were some a uh, few left, and there were people fighting, you know, for more for a little bit more and fighting for their issues that they have at their place. But Hoffa forced, you know, forced through the contract after people even voted it down twice, right? Um, and what he did is he used a loophole in the Constitution saying if they were um, voting no over stuff that's already, you know, resolved in the national issue, they could force it through, which was a, which is really a violation of uh, the IDP Constitution because you know, that wasn't true, you know. Like, for example, Louisville, the big air hub that I was talking about. Uh, they have a particular issue that's particular to the air hub, you know, that they were still negotiating over. Now, when they show up to work, it, it's, uh, sometimes it may take up to half an hour to get into their work area, because it's an airport. They arrive there, they gotta go through security, you know, gotta go through, you know, all that nonsense, right? So. They were fighting, you know, they were fighting still for, you know, uh, you know, local issues, but the contract was forced through, forced on them anyway. So, I mean, you know, but, uh, but through a struggle, right, through the vote no, we got improvements and in initially over to health care. Uh, we got, you know, improvements locally, you know, in, in our area, 705 and 710. Got improvements uh, on the five, you know, extra five hours on the part-time vacation. I mean, we ran the same vote no campaign in 705, right? But they uh, they had more of a political machine. They didn't get caught for embezzlement. So you know, I was you know organizing the vote no. There was other people that you know split off from me that was also organizing the vote no. I probably did as much as the whole group put together, but um, yeah. But we weren't, we weren't able to be successful with that. So anyhow, right. So now, this, uh, so after all this happened, right, the people were basically fed up with the international leadership. You know, and down the road, they had the election, right, for the international, uh, for um, the last election for the international presidents, right? So the rank and file members voted. And it was kind of like the uh, general election in the United States. Hoffa lost the popular vote in the United States. Just like Hillary, just like Trump, you know, uh, Trump uh, lost the uh, popular vote in the United States. But uh, he won through, you know, electoral college, you know, something that goes back to the days of slavery. Well, in our case, it was the Canada vote. You know, it wasn't a reform presence in Canada. So we won two of the uh, four regions in the United States and we won the popular vote in the United States we lost in Canada. But, you know, he, he uh, barely got in office and the last contract barely passed. So, so coming up in this, uh, to, uh, this uh, current contract that's expiring, you know, the conventional wisdom would think, you know, they would have to do a little bit more, right, uh, for a decent contract because, you know, politically he barely won office, the contract, you know, barely passed, and, you know, he had to basically use repressive measures to shove the contract down on the members. Okay, but you know we're seeing a lot of signs, you know, that it's just a, you know same old, same old is a sales job, you know uh, the same old, uh, basically you know the dog and horse show once again, because what they'll do is, you know they'll say some of the right things, make it look like you know it's going on, you know like the, the dog and pony show, for example. Okay, they removed Ken Hall, the guy who negotiated the concessionary contracts. So, you know, a lot of people might be happy about that, right? But who did they put in his place? They put Sean Lyon O'Brien, the Boston bully. He, he's the one that negotiated the, the concessionary supplements. The contract barely passed, but the supplements got voted down, so they put, put that guy in there. But he's a, a political opportunist. He's been with Hoffa since, you know, you know, day one. But he had some political aspirations to be the general president next time. So he's doing some tough talking about the contract, more, you know, more hot air. But he's, he's saying the right things. 
So then he was removed from the negotiating committee for you know putting up, you know, looking like he was going to fight the company. So then they put uh, DT. Uh, if you guys are familiar with those initials, DT. You know, they're like two peas in a pod. They put in there Dennis the Menace Taylor, right? You know, basically another um, opportunist uh, to, to negotiate the contract. You know, it's the same thing that goes into politics. You know, you're removing all these people, but you know, that's what happens when you have an authoritarian regime. They keep on shuffling the people under, and I guess it's a minor victory getting rid of them, but you need the chop from the top, you know. And it's still that, you know, it, the problems are systemic anyway. So anyhow, okay, so now, you know, now they're promising, right? They're promising more transparency. But, you know, the information they're, they're getting out, they're, they're, they're not giving out any specific details. You know, basically it's the same old, same old brown up, not informing the members of the specifics of the contract. And then, you know, uh, since you know, the last election, you know, uh, uh, the uh, reform slate won two regions. So there's some people from the reform slate on the negotiating committee and some, you know, people that they had to make some concessions to to put on the negotiating committee. But there's some information being leaked out to the members about the contract, right? So, uh, so the, the people are being, you know, several people have been removed from the negotiating committee for informing the members about what's going on, right? So, I mean, those those are some examples politically of signs, you know, the contract is going to be concessionary, you know, putting in people that you know. Uh, Negotiate a concessionary contract, then taking them out from once they're standing up and actually going to do, you know, act like they're going to do something, and then removing people, you know, that they uh, alleged are leaking information. Now, some other signs that it's going to be concessionary contract. Well, it's been one contract after another contract. You see a pattern of history there, right? But you can see uh, by what UPS does right before the contract to negotiate, uh, to see what what they're going to want negotiated. In this peak season, right, what happened? UPS was using personal vehicles to deliver packages. And the international didn't really do anything. You know, not the international, but I don't want to, you know, third party. It's the, the, the hog for hall, you know, hog for dance hall cabal. And we got a lot of pejoratives for those knuckleheads. But they didn't do anything when they were basically letting, you know, the Uberize our package delivery. And another thing they were doing is, in some areas, they forced the drivers to work up 70 hours on delivering packages. So the contract says 60 hours, but they were making them work six days a week in 70 hours. And you know, it didn't happen in our local. Our local fought back. It didn't happen in, in uh, the East Coast. You know, under uh, you know Sean O'Brien. You know, because he was a. Uh, you know, he's has aspirations for running for general president. So he's been finally fighting back after all these years, or well, after having a history of being with Hoffa, after a history of, of crushing union democracy. So I give you a little, just a little of uh, what he's about. Uh, some people are running for local office against some of his minions who are our local officers. He threatened these members with retaliation from running for local office. He was actually you know, suspended from the teachers for a short period of time. So that's the kind of person and political opportunist he is. But anyhow, so these are some examples, right, of what UPS is doing. And, uh, and there, there's really been no pushback from the international, right, on these issues. I mean, there were some initial good proposals, on, well, decent proposals on the UPS contract, you know, uh, against harassment, uh, against discipline, against dishonesty, those things. If, if people want to, you know, get more into depth about those, you know, or any of these things, that, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, go on and on, but if there's an interest, you know, when the time comes to ask some questions about these, some specifics about it. But, you know, so there are some initial decent proposals, but, you know, he allowed you, you know, in the, art, in the process of negotiations, right, to uh, let them be watered down or take them off the table, right? So, I mean, that, that, was, that was a big problem and some early signs, you know, uh, that there's going to be a concessionary contract. And uh, 
Oh yeah, and uh, there were some other uh, things that were taken off the table. Uh, uh, the, the fact that you know, against you know, we uh, some proposals we had to uh, ban uh, self-driving vehicles and drones, but those were also taken off the table. So I mean, he's taking all these things off the table. And now some um, some other particular issues with this uh, all this forced overtime. Right now we have. Uh, some uh, language called 9-5. So, you know, to reduce the force over time. But you have to opt in, you gotta jump through hoops, you gotta work over 9-5, uh, three days, and that doesn't count your hour lunch, so it's 10 and a half days, right? And, uh, I, I, and then, to get, you know, you're supposed to get paid a penalty. So to get paid a penalty, you have to file a grievance. So, I mean, one of the, one of the key things to do on this 9-5 on this is basically, that you're automatically on the 9-5, you have to opt out. And then you, you don't have to file agreements that it would appear, you know, the penalty would appear on your check, like, overtime. But it seems like, you know, they're just basically a brown on, they're not trying to release information. And when information is released, you know, it really doesn't sound too good, not good at all. Um, and one of the crazy things, it wasn't even a UPS proposal, it was proposed by DT. Dennis the Menace Taylor. He, pro he actually proposed a second tier, second tier drivers. Now, it would be a full-time job, but it would be paid at a lower scale, and they could either work Tuesday through Saturday, uh, su Sunday through Thursday. So this would uh, eliminate you know, premium pay if somebody's forced to work overtime on Sundays. So I mean, this, this is what we're looking at, you know, uh, basically. Uh, class collaborators, um, you know, class traders, you know, selling out the membership. Uh, you know, what what hope do we have? This, this is the hope that we have, right? I mean, so the last contract uh, barely passed. The last time they barely got elected. There are some reformers in two regions on the executive board. There's another contract campaign organizing, and it's you know. And one thing they did, which is probably more with the dog and pony show, the last contract they didn't, they didn't even put in the paperwork to strike if they came down to it, right? So the last time the contract was basically a vote no campaign. This time they put in the paperwork to go on strike if necessary. Now that, you know, and that doesn't mean they will. It's probably a dog and a horse show. But, you know, they felt compelled. They have to do a certain amount of things because their position. Now, there's a movement, and, and the, you know, they're trying to hold up on the vote no, because we're going to have to have a, a vote yes and a strike authorization vote. And then go to the switch to the vote no on the contract, right, most likely. But, but there's, a, there's a, something going on right now at ABF, another, UP, another team for contract. And it, they're, they're doing a vote no campaign over there, and the reform movement's pushing it, right? So we can expect the same kind of thing, the vote no movement, after the strike authorization is approved. But, now here, here's a little extra thing. What they're doing now is electronic voting. Uh, so I, I mean, I'm, I'm on all the conference calls for the, uh, for the contract, ABF, UPS, whatever. And so they have this electronic voting. They lie, at the very least been disingenuous saying it's the same. It's not. They're gonna, he said the same. You're getting mailed a ballot. Well, yeah, you are getting mailed a ballot. But you either, you know, you're going to get a code. You have to go online, on, you know, on a computer, on your cell phone, you know, call it in, whatever, and vote. Now, there's been all this, you know, issues with electronic voting in the United States and the government elections. You know, there's, you know, whether it's the Republicans or the Demon Rats, you know, or, or the people running the machine, they can be hacked. So, you know, there's that issue. But there's also a more subtle issue. If the people believe the vote is going to be rigged, they'll probably not want to vote. So, and, you know, in the, in the administration will organize their people to vote, but most of the people, and they, most of the people don't vote anyway. If most people voted, it would be voted down. But and this may discourage people to vote, and that might be their plan all along. You know, you know, it remains to be seen. But we're seeing how we're going to see how it plays out in ABF. But now. So it seems like the strategy for the reform movement is going to be a vote no. But the thing is, we can organize, you know, if, you know, they could rig the, uh, the, the electronic ballots. 
you know, or people can be discouraged about, but even if all that goes well, even if all that goes well, people, you know, even if the, the people, oh no, or the majority of people in the country, what's gonna, what's gonna stop them from coming up with some other, you know, other kind of loophole, some other way to force the contract down a member's throat. So regardless what the international union does, regardless what the locals do, regardless what the reform movement does, do we need rank and file, rank and file power? The members got to organize from the bottom up and be prepared to strike, be prepared to wildcat, in spite of what the, the uh, official bureaucracy does. Rank and file members have to be prepared to wildcat to get a good contract. Otherwise, there, it's going to be concessionary. Because, you know, the more the struggle, you know, what a vote no, you may, uh, you know, uh, mitigate some of the concessions, but it will be concessionary unless the members are prepared to wildcat. Like the teachers did, like the, like the teachers were uh, wildcatting in West Virginia, inspired teachers from all around the country to stand up and fight back. You know, so, you know, we step, I step to the teacher, uh, the Teamsters and say, you know, the te teachers got more intestinal fortitude than the Teamsters? Come on now. So we got to stand up and fight back, uh, you know, stand up and wildcat. Uh, um, how are we looking for time? Otherwise, I could go into more details. Uh, we, we can give, go another 15 minutes or so. Oh. Take quite, okay, all right. So I can uh, cover uh, some a little extra stuff. Right, um, and then about 7.30 we'll get into questions, okay? All right. Okay, so during this contract campaign, there, there was uh, some interesting um, uh, things happening. Right. Uh, okay, uh, there was a triple murder related to the UPS uh, contract campaign in the last uh, contract. Now, you know, you know, there's always talk about social media, right? Social media get people all worked up when, you know, you might have saw that thing on Facebook Live when that one person was killing people on Facebook Live. Now, this wasn't on Facebook Live. But, like I said, I was, you know, uh, organizing, right, around, around uh, northern, uh, northern half of Illinois and uh, northern half of Indiana. And, you know, during this, I met all kinds of people and we were organizing, you know, and I had, you know, people at different buildings, crews, and, you know, a person here, a person there, you know, and so we're on social media, you know, now, and, uh, you know, uh, one of my, uh, you know, people, one of my, uh, one of my teenster sisters was basically being bullied and harassed by a, a vote yes kind of person, right? So, you know, so I'm, you know, I'm jumping in, you know, standing up in solidarity. You know, going back and saying, you know, hey, I'm gonna, I want to be coming out to your facility to campaign for the vote, no, and blah, blah, blah. You know, and this is one of those yeah. most southern ones that might have been down by Springfield, I forget. Well, anyhow, you know, he's making some, uh, some thrust, but I ain't worried about, you know, just people talking crap. Well, anyhow, a little bit later on, I guess it comes to the fact that he was having domestic issues. He was uh, getting divorced, and uh, he snapped, and uh, he went and uh, killed his wife, and... Uh, our new boyfriend or whatever in a bar, and he was uh, killed himself because there was two uh, law enforcement officers there. So I mean, I could have been out going, to, you know, just thinking this guy's talking a little trash. I mean, I'm going to live or die to fight for the teamsters, but I didn't think, you know, you know, not expecting this guy, you know, you know, uh, on that, you know, he's ready to snap, you know. So that was a little interesting thing. You just don't know. Uh, and, and we can talk about a little bit about the electoral politics of the teamsters. Okay. You know, I want to make sure, you know, talk first about what's important is the rank and file members, right? But how do we get this kind of leader that mobilized the membership? Well, the Teamsters, it says it on there, was founded in 1903. And I voted in the first Teamster election. Now, I got a little gray in my beard, you know, but I'm not that old. But the first Teamster election for international officers by the membership was in 1991 even though the teams were started in 1903. It was basically maybe a 20-year struggle by this reform organization that won, us, won the right for the, in, uh, for the members to vote for their international officers, a direct vote. Now, how did this happen? Previously, the members voted for the delegates to go to the convention. Then at the convention, they would elect the teams for leaders. Now, it is, you know, it's changed. It's changed 
we, you know, still got to vote for delegates, but the delegates go to the international convention, but these delegates nominate, and then they're voted on by the membership. Now, what they're trying to do is change the percentage of they need to get for the nomination. It's 5% right now. They want to change it to 10%. In this last election, they won the popular vote in Illinois, I mean, the popular vote in the United States, but did not even get 10% of the delegates at the convention. Because the convention is mostly officers, officers that support the incumbent. So it's democracy, but there's levels to this stuff, if you get what I'm saying. So they're trying to change the way we uh, nominate to prevent reformers coming in. But that's basically how he got it. He was elected by the members. It was a three-way race. It was, you know, it was two officers, you know, two, basically two old guards versus reformer. Now they switched the, switched the gears on us since then. Reformers weren't, have not been able to get elected since, because what they would do is one of the old guards would break off, pretend to be a reformer to stop, you know, so then it would split the vote against the incumbent. So they, they, they switched, they flipped the script and that's been what's been happening in the last elections. But the last was, one was really close and, uh, you know, their time is coming, you know, but, it, you know, that's electoral politics and you have limits, you know, the limits of electoral politics. Uh, there's another, uh, another thing that's also popping off at UPS. Anybody hear of the Me Too scandal? Yes. It's going on around this country, well, right. Yeah. So there's a Me Too scandal going on at UPS. Okay. Right. I mean, UPS has a history of that, right? And in this case, you know, it's mostly women, but, um, you know, managers, and it's mostly an issue of power, though. It's power. It manage, management personnel taking their authority, and, you know, big, and for the most part, it's young, young women, you know, you know, and, and demanding that they offer sexual favors to get promoted to supervisory positions. Now, you know, now I blame the people at the top who are doing this, but the people who are accepting these offers are opportunistic people as well. You know, and what it, what it, it creates is a situation where people are put in there who are incompetent of doing the job. There shouldn't be no capitalism, there shouldn't be no supervisors, managers to start with, but this brings out the worst, you know, worst possible people. And it creates a symbiotic relationship, right? Because then, you know, management, you know, they got their job for doing what they did, but then management can't fire them because then they can go to man, you know, go to UPS to say, you know, what happened to them. So now, situ you know, now a situation in uh, the catch facility. There was uh, one uh, African American female, and. She uh, got a relationship uh, with a full-time soup, and, and they were living together, and you know, she became a, a part-time soup. So while this was going on, she had a relationship with uh, an, an upper management. You know, he's the head of one section of the building, you know, thousands of people on her. You know, he's bigger than a, you know, a center manager because he owned a lot more people than that. And uh, I guess she was also having a relationship with a security guard. So. So then there was, you know, you know, there was a filming of the video at the, at the supervisor's house. He put a camera in, and you know, see, there's all these rumors. So I want to, you know, facts, you know, before I go to the media. But I'm talking to a bunch of different people, and the juiciest, the juiciest version I heard is there was an orgy going on over there, and he videotaped it. And so then, when the supervisor was questioned about the details of this situation, he lied about it. So he was, he was basically walked out for that. When all this come out, all these people are, you know, over 20 some managers are being walked out. But this is just something that's being exposed. Like in the Harvey facility where I work, this manager that came in, when he came in the facility, he threatened, you know, he threatened, he came in there to fire me, you know. So uh, this guy looks like, uh, I don't know if anybody's seen Hogan's Heroes, but he looks like Colonel Clink without a spectacle, right? And he, he's basically, you know, his name is Wagner, right? So, I mean, Wagner, you're right. Offense, right? All he needs is that spectacle. And wherever he goes, um, he, he hires, uh, he puts in young black females as supervisors. He's basically running UPS like a plantation, you know? And he's trying to get out of there, you know, before, you know, because uh, he wants to get out of there and retire before this comes to his home. You know, and his wife finds out about it, but I like, you know, to expose that and let him, let them know. And also, you know, it's a matter of power. So, 
I mean, also, you know, managers, you know, that um, are homosexual, we're also doing the same, you know, the same thing to, uh, you know, ma males, and then also the female supervisors will do the same thing as well. Since you know, some of them got in there for that, they'll do the same thing, harass people, sexually harass people as well. But there's one um, male manager, a, a white middle-aged guy, he would peek through the cracks in the bathroom at uh, African males going to the bathroom. I mean, this is a whole plantation mentality at UPS. And uh, look what we got here. UPS, tightest slave ship in a shipping business. This is from the 1997 contract. And boy, did they hate that when it came out of the picket line. You know, UPS asked us to, you know, not to bring it out, so they printed some more, right? So, yeah, I didn't get to show off all the shirts, too. I might as well show off the shirts. You know, each uh, shirt, you know, part of it is, you know, the, the contract campaigns is T-shirts. People wearing T-shirts in solidarity, you know, uh, you know, once a week, you know, to show people, you know, five years, one of the con contract shirts from one of the contracts. Well worn. It's our contract. We'll fight for it. Uh, here's another one up over here. So it's trying to get away from me. I'm afraid I'm going to wear it some more and wear it out. This one is a more recent one. In part time at uh, poverty at UPS. Uh, I think this was uh, possibly from 2013. And uh, oh, yeah, okay. And this says uh, one day longer, one day stronger. So, uh, yeah, that, that's an interesting uh, story, too. I got, got a couple of minutes. Uh, so anyhow, the, the one, the one uh, organizing I did around uh, them cutting off the radio worked really well, right? You know, most of the people wanted the radio and the members got behind it. Well, I had another campaign that didn't go so well. My one day longer, one day stronger campaign. Okay, management, one of the things management does is to do our work and, and, you know, get close to us and they like, you know, they like to touch me, you know, touch me on my shoulder, whatever. They know about me. I got grievances on them, and they'll make no physical contact with me, accident or otherwise. So anyhow, what? Are, but I'm working a split shift. Oh, I didn't even go into that. Okay, in 2008, they used the excuse of the bad, um, the bad economy to try to lay off uh, the combo job people. We got language in our contract. We could take the layoff. We could go to another facility. They're trying to get rid of the full-time jobs from this small facility. So I didn't want to do that, or a split shift. So I ended up working a split shift. I worked the, almost like my contract campaign, right? <laughs> that I would work one shift in the morning, you know, before the drivers, and one in the evening. So I wouldn't get a full night's sleep all week for the last five years I worked there. I would get two hours sleep here, three hours sleep there. So anyhow, management comes there is working next to me. I worked one shift, and I was so tired between one, going to one shift and the next shift, I didn't, you know, take a shower in between the two shifts. In the, in the summertime, I got to take two showers a day, right? So I got to work twice a day. So anyhow, I, I just fell asleep on my couch. I came back. I was, you know, a little sweaty from working the other shift. And the manager was like, oh, you smell. You know, somebody else goes and work next to him because he was working next to me. And I got an idea. I, get, I don't take a shower, right? He won't work next to me, and they won't touch me. So I started, you know, my one day longer, one day stronger campaign. So I wouldn't shower, you know, between Monday and Friday. You know, I take my shower when I get off work on Friday and I start all over from scratch. You know, wearing the same same pair of clothes all week long. Oh. Right. So so you know, I was trying to get other, you know, members to you know get involved. Now, this is the shirt I would wear every day, right? <laughs> trying to get all the members behind. But this didn't this there's there's no wrong tactics, you know, as far as tactics. But if you don't get other people behind you, it doesn't work. So I try to get people involved in this campaign because I'm ready to fight them, you know, on anything. So anyway, you know, I got some people that agree to wear the clothes two days in a row or shower every other day. But most of the people didn't get on it. They got, you know, they got members to write statements against me. And the management, you know, basically come up, you know, basically and said, yeah, don't, don't shower. And then you know, basically they sent me to, uh, to uh, the doctor for mental health. It wasn't a doctor, right? I mean, it wasn't a mental health doctor. It was a, it was a regular practitioner. So I was asking for union representation because I didn't, you know, I didn't answer all their questions. They fired me. I got my job back, whatever. But I mean, that was an example. You know how it didn't unify the members. So I mean, you got to use tactics that unify the members. It was only, you know, me. You know, it was a big issue to me. You know, management doing the work. You know, and it's an issue to a lot of people, but. You know, you got to find the right tactic for, for, uh, for the right situation 
to unify the members. So you know, I thought, you know, I'd give you know, a little extra time. You know, it, was, it was a fun story. But I mean, you kind of got that from the IRA. You know, the IRA was in prison. You know, and they, they were using the blankets and no showering. I mean, they, they were using by any means necessary. And that's how serious, uh, you know, my fight against uh, UPS is. And, you know, I can go on and on and on, but I guess that's uh, good for today. All right. Let's thank Brother Joe. You're willing to take a few questions. You're willing to take a few questions. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna take. I'll I'll take the liberty of the first one, and then we'll get you. And as soon as Andy gets in here, we'll moderate. Unless you wanna. Do I answer them as they're coming? Yeah, pretty much. If you, if you no, don't want. Them. All right. I heard that maybe you can use drones to deliver things. Is there any truth in that? Uh, UPS has already uh, tested drones for deliveries. You know, I mean, they always come up with some BS argument. You know, you know, they, they sell it in a way that, you know, these are for deliveries that the package cars, you know, can't get to real quick. Oh, we can deliver, you know, medicine to remote areas and all that. But they're using, you know, I didn't go into all the different ways they're, they're, they're trying to get over, you know, and take work off the, the, the member, you know, members and cut hours and this, Yes, uh, the drone, I mean, they're not going to be delivering 150 pound packages, at least at first. But yeah, you know, they, they have that capability, and, and you can see that coming in the future if the union officials don't stand up and fight it. Good. You know, I, I, I work every day with UPS because I ship packages out, and I'm wondering how much of where you are, like their data services and their cloud storage, and. The, their financing for small business and just how much they can get into a small business and then how much they would feel at the same time that they're kind of beholden to UPS. Can you comment or do you know anything about that? Uh, that's not, not my field of expertise, but UPS is trying to expand in all kinds of logistics. They're, you know, these, these companies, these freight companies, these package companies are, are changing their business model to a logistics model. You know, I mean, they do similar stuff with, with uh, and, you know, I read recently an article, so I'll talk about that, about medical supplies. So the, what they'll do is, you know, they'll store these medical supplies in these refrigerated temperatures, you know, in these facilities and then ship them up, you know, just in time deliveries kind of stuff. So, I mean, yes, they're, they're expanding the logistics. I don't know the particulars about your situation, mm -hmm. but, you know, and the thing is, all these things, um, anything they do, you know, we should uh, organize, and organize the union, you know, in, in all aspects of the way, you know, because just like when the Teamsters initially started, it was horse and buggy carriage, right? Mm -hmm. And shortly thereafter, they went to trucks and then they organized to drive the trucks. You know, they, they organized that they would be trained to drive the trucks. And the same thing would go, I'd say, you know, when they, as they expand, you know, we should, uh, get access to organized unions wherever they go. I, I, and as a corollary, are you familiar with their call center conditions and some of the conditions that the call center people work under, like during the holidays, the mandatory overtime on 12-hour shifts? Okay. Uh, what do you mean by call center? I'm talking about where they call up, a customer calls up, and they get into a UPS call center, and sometimes those people there, especially like during the holidays, they're forced to work some 12-hour shifts because of the volume of calls that, that come in. And they're like, they're, they're like, I think, represented by the International Telecommunications Workers Unions. I just was wondering if you're familiar with their, with, with, with their uh, plight or any of their contracts as well. Uh, that's not my full expertise either, but I'm on the idea of one big union. You know, you know I mean, what I'm familiar with in UPS, we got the team at our facilities, we got the Teamsters, and the mechanics are represented by the IAM. So there's other unions representing, and I'm also for union, you know, there's conflicting things. I'm for also for union democracy, right? Mm -hmm. You know, people should be allowed to be in the, union, the particular union of their choice. But, you know, we should, if we're okay. separate unions, we should all be sitting down at the same table as, as a united front of all the unions and have the same deadlines of the contracts and negotiate, you know, as, as one, even if it's, even if it's uh, different unions. But, you know, I don't know the particulars. It doesn't surprise me. The drivers are, you know, were forced to work 70 hours, the maximum of the, the federal uh, labor law, but our contract says 60. Right. Okay. 
Okay, my, my uh, friend just got a part-time job at UPS. And he wants to be uh, full-time. What would you recommend for him to keep his job? Uh, do they harass people there? Well, yeah, they manage by, the nicest way to put it is they manage by stress. You know, they have this concept of least best. They keep on pushing and pushing and they'll, they'll harass the least best person. You know, put pressure on them, make an example. Now, I mean, I'm stubborn, you know, and I stuck it out, you know, and stuff like that. And, uh, but uh, I'd, I'd say take advantage, if you're just starting out, take advantage of the program to get your schooling and, and move on, you know, to, to something else, to be honest with you. But um, it took me 13 years to go full time, you know, and, you know, sometimes it takes 19, 20 years. You know, there, lately there's been, a, you know, moving a little bit quicker, you know, down the list of getting those inside full-time jobs. And sometimes there's a little bit openings that people want to go driving, but I get in two accidents a year on average. So, you know, you know that's why when we struck in 97, I one of those 10,000 10, full-time jobs, and I got the inside job, that was the one for me, you know. So, I mean, I wouldn't suggest making a career out of it. People could, you know, if they can, but, you know, I've seen people come on the very first day of work and then, uh, you know, don't come back after break. You know, but I wouldn't su suggest that, but if, if, if they don't mind hard work and uh, harassment, you know, you, you, can, you can make, as far as the working class, you can make top scale, you know, you know, as far as driving a package car, uh, driving a feeder truck, you can make top scale, but it's a very stressful job. What's a typical pay for top for a driver? I'm, I'm retired, but uh, when I was, uh, Working, uh, let me see. So it's, a, um, let me see. It's uh, about, it's probably around thirty-five dollars an hour, maybe a little bit more now. You know. So, oh, and, dur and during, see, in but they're only paying the starting pay is only ten dollars an hour at UPS. You know, in the city where the minimum wage gone up, it's a little bit higher. So that doesn't make any sense. They work the, their most profitable time of year. They're working drivers 12 hours, even 70 hours a week. Anything over eight, they're paying overtime. So they're paying time and a half. So they're, you know, they're getting paid, you know, they're making, you know, over $45 an hour, close to $50 an hour, right? And that's their most profitable time of year. But they say they can't afford to pay the part-timers more than $10 an hour. And then their most profitable time of year is when they're paying people that much money. So, you know, they, they can, you know, we need a bigger slice of the pot. We need the biggest wage increases for the part-timers, right? You know, there's a movement for Fight for 15 around the country. Well, you know, I didn't, you know, I, I, I left that out, but, uh, we, you know, they're talking, the reform movement is talking about $15 an hour. I'm talking 15 52 I did the math. 15, the 52 cents would cover union dues for part-timers. It's because you're in a union not to make less. And, you know, at least you should make the same. All right. Charlie. Yeah, Joe. <coughs> I've written contracts, and they're complex documents. Sometimes several hundred pages. What are your contracts? Thirty-seven articles. There's all sorts of trade-offs and things of job security versus this. And I don't understand it. You put together a negotiating team. And I presume they know the, the ins and outs of the industry, and you're not the only people negotiating contracts. And then you guys just show up later and say, they're no good? Uh, on what basis can you say that? Are, are I mean, you, honestly, are you done? how many of your pals have read the entire <laughs> contract? <laughs> I don't know how many of your uh, members read the contract, but you're, you mentioned Article 37. <coughs> Man, I don't know. It's just so appropriate because we had a discussion before, and we we're talking about dignity and respect. And Article 37 is the dignity and respect article that you know the employer shall teach us with dignity, treat us with dignity and respect. So, uh, in that article. You know, we got a list of things that employers can't do to us. They can't harass, intimidate, coerce, blah, 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 blah. The last contract, we got the word bullying added to it. But all that means nothing because there's not a financial penalty. So that's another thing that we need in this contract. We were proposals against harassment 
in the contract. You know what I mean? In the initial proposals. Well, well sold out. What? Where are you going to get a financial penalty? That, that's that's Where? That, that, that's exactly what we need. We need a financial penalties yeah, right. for every violation of the contract. Otherwise, there's there's no penalty and there's no reason why they shouldn't continue violating the contract. So what you should strive for is to get at least one more article of your contract, one more violation that has a, a financial penalty. Now, our our, uh, our con contract, you know, 30, Article 37 is right about in the middle of our article, so it's about halfway through. So, uh, in any of I'm negotiating the contract. Okay, we got these union officials like like uh, Hogfoot Jr. He never worked a hard day's work in his life. He's a lawyer. He never worked in the industry. You know what we need is rank and file members who work in the industry, knows the job, knows the conditions on the job. What we, and and then they need to you know get the the union education. And what we need is working class intellectuals. You know. To have the knowledge to stand up and fight back who has the intestinal fortitude. Okay. okay. I have a question. I mean, look, first of all, I'm not in the Teamsters. I'm in, and I don't work for UPS. I'm, um, I'm a, a member of the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, and I, uh, and I work for Mariano's. Um, suppose you have a situation where, where management breaks its own rules, and you try to file a grievance, and your official union representative sides with management. Now, in those circumstances, what would, what would you do? I mean, you've been talking about stuff, problems with the Teamsters. I'm curious, what would you what would you do about that? You would have to take each individual situation as an individual situation. Now, there's options, right? Mm -hmm. Now, for, see, when you. The nature of filing a grievance, the grievance is the property of the union. That's kind of the basic for how it works. But, you know, there, there's a thing that the, uh, the union has a duty of fair representation, uh -huh. representing the member fairly. So you've got you to gotta judge on that situation whether it would merit filing a duty of fair representation charge. You know, as, as a union steward, you know, you know, uh, a uh, member comes to me with a problem. You know, I look at the problem. You know, it, it you know it may or may not be a grievance. Not all problems are grievances. Mm -hmm. You know, we may be able to do some, organize around it. It might be an article in the contract. You know, you know I try to get pretty creative. You know, we may maybe we could use past practice. But you know, I try to fight for the members against management. You know, it's not I'm not like a third party. You know what I mean? You know, I'm there. I am there to serve the members. I am of the membership. So right. So but you know, you know, it's a you know you have to look at it on an individual basis. But there, there's a possibility of following a duty of fair representation. But sometimes no. you know, sometimes there's an issue that's just without merit. You know, and there's no merit there as well. You know, but I have to look at the individual situation. You go to your local office. Well, my, my, this is just merely a hypothetical, right, well, if I may clarify, please, right. this is a, merely a hypothetical uh, question, but the underlying assumption of the question is that, is that the, the rule violation by management definitely happened, okay? So it's not, it's not something without merit. Uh, right. The thing is, there's a rule violation and there's a contract. You mean it's a contract violation? Well, it's, it's it, it actually, actually, it's, um, I don't know, maybe I should tell what the specific it, it, thing it, it, is. It, it, there's there's no, a specific no, no. incident. Okay, here's the deal. I'll, I'll tell everybody. Okay. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I uh, called in, I called in, oh, you want me to stop? Yeah, yeah done. we don't need it. We um, don't. There's locals have all sorts of... Oh, you have a local. You have officers. Oh, call them. Up, don't huh? you talk to? Don't you know who runs your local? There's all sorts of decisions made about grievance arbitrations. Okay. Some of these are voted on. Even. Okay. If it meant an expenditure of money. Okay. Whether or not you pursue grievances or not. Okay. You are. You have a field representative, and then from your headquarters or whatever. Then you have your local officers. Okay. That's what they're 
what's what officers are for okay right one, one thing charlie was talking about one thing is the union steward found the grievance right but then you know sometimes the union steward can settle the grievance but usually you know if, you know if they you know if they can deal with the particular management like i had a a, a, a new a new uh, full-time soup on one ship and he didn't want no trouble so i come something to him supervisor's working he would agree to pay it out. Simple as that. Everything would be taken care of. The other manager was trying to get me, you know, trying to fire me. So he wouldn't even sign my grievance. He would refuse to sign. So I mean, it's different with each one. But the, the steward can file the grievance. But what Charlie was talking about, you know, arbitration costs money. They, you know, you take it. You know, once you look at the grievance, and it's the union's decision to decide whether you know to take this further on. You know, or it could, you know, if they lose it, it could set bad precedents. You know, all that stuff for the higher ups. But you know, as a rank and file steward, I try to do my best to represent the members. But each particular case, you know, it has to be judged on that individual case, and because there could be, you know, I don't want to sound like a you know, business, you know, business agent, but there could be repercussions with decisions on grievances. Uh -huh. Okay, you could even represent yourself, correct? It's not a duty of fair representation case, so. No. It could be. No, 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 absolutely not. All right. Are you still doing work for the Teamsters or UPS contract in any way since you retired? I wouldn't. So when I ran the contract campaign, you know, and uh, the, the vote no, they got voted down, uh, voted down the contract in uh, 710. I was doing it on my own time, in my own capacity as a rank and file member. So I'm retired now. Uh, no, so I'm uh, working on the ABF contract campaign, the UPS contract campaign. You know, uh, doing what I do because you know, and I'm still fighting, fighting UPS. It ain't never gonna be over. You know, in my book, they're gonna be my arch nemesis. You know, they're the villain in my book. You know. in trouble. <laughs> there, there, there used to be no, no mafia figures in the Teamsters. Is it still that way? No. You're saying there used to be no mafia figures? There used to be known. They were oh, known yeah, yeah. with Hatha. Right, right. So, I mean, this was part of uh, the reform organization. You know, they were fighting the corruption in the union and the organized crime. And, and that was part of the struggle to, to get elect, you know, elected, uh, have, an, have elections by the general membership. That was part of the struggle. You know, we knew. You know, if we have government, we had government oversight of the union, you know, because of the corruption. And, and uh, the reform movement didn't want really the government involved that much, you know. And they wanted to have elections and for us to clean it up ourselves. So it was a struggle. And I'm not saying there's, there's no mafia people, but, you know, we, we had that oversight. So when they did stuff wrong, they tended to eventually get caught. Now, there's corrupt officials. You know, and there might be, you know, who knows, you know, who knows, I mean, I wouldn't know it. I'm not aware of any mafia in the Teamsters right now. But are there corrupt officials? Yes, there are. If there's any mafia, there could still be some, but there are corrupt officials. The problem is they're going to, they're ending the, this, uh, the consent decree with some stipulations. So we're going to have less government oversight. I prefer us to take care of ourselves, but, you know, all these officials after this, uh, consent decree is happening, one after another is still getting corruption charges on international officers. Rome Alois is out. He was the international vice president. Uh, e. coli, his father was a mobster, son of a mobster. He got out on extortion charges just recently. And the investigation is further. Just like they're talking about the subpoenas with Trump, they're talking about subpoenas finally, possibly getting the Hoffa Jr., finally reaching him based on uh, rigging the benefit funds, you know, corruption, and uh, getting, possibly getting, uh, you know, payoffs or gifts. So it, it might actually reach Hoffa, just like hopefully it will reach Trump and hopefully, you know, it will reach Trump and hopefully it'll reach uh, Junior Hoffa. It, you know, it may, may get him. But. Does the DHL have the same trouble with, uh, you know, their company? I don't work at DHL, but it's the same issue at all corporations. If there's a corporation, you got a boss, you need a union. Uh, our local represents people at, uh, at DHL. I mean, I'm not there, but you know, some companies are better than others. But it's a small package division. 
We represent people at DHL. Um, give you a little, just a little bit about DHL. Um, a few years ago, I think he's waiting. A few years ago, they stopped. Uh, Sir. They stopped uh, delivery from point to point within the United States. So we're just doing international from from you know from another country to uh, a place in the United States. But now what what the internet going on? Uh, they're they're re-expanding again in in the United States. They're one of the biggest shipping companies in the world. It's the German post office. Uh, we have representation there, but I don't know about the particular issues. But you can just assume you know you know more or less it's the same thing going on in all corporations. Uh, any more questions? Um, I have a question. I, look, I came late, but did you ever talk in your lecture about the significance of May Day, which was a few days ago? Yeah, I know. It's like I wanted to get into that. I didn't want to go off on too many tangents, but mm -hmm. yeah, I, I participated in, in May Day. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm, now that this, this is over, I'm going to start my organizing for the next May Day, right? And I'm a uh, be, be reaching out to unions for a general strike. You don't probably expect them to do that, but try to reach everybody at the level they're at. If they can, you know, have events or participate in events that going, uh, talk to people. If the unions don't want to organize general strikes, uh, one, uh, you know, you know, organize for people to rock out in mass. If we don't get to that level, people uh, individually, you know, no call, no show. If they can't do that, call in. You know, but if if uh, if the people still want to work, we got to organize disruptions of people showing up to work. But uh, you know that would be on the uh, direct action kind of underground stuff. You know that won't be on uh, being recorded. But one of the things we can organize for the unions to do as they come up, you know, a long-term strategy, right? Just like you know, in our contract, we got certain days off. You know, Christmas, uh, Thanksgiving. We should, you know, Labor Day. We should organize for another day off, organized for Labor Day. We're working harder and faster, so we should organize unions as uh, a day off. But um, I didn't work for several years at UPS. You know, that'd be the day I'd always call off once a year, May Day, for the last so many years when I was working there. You, your, your union has elections, right? Yes. So what sense is, and these are monitored by the Department of Labor, right? Uh, they're they're, they're right, actually I'll, monitored. It's a leading question because they are. Uh, uh, but they're like monitored by the IRB. There was a special government oversight, extra, extra, extra oversight. Yeah, but uh, I hear you guys claiming your union's undemocratic. I heard it tonight. But you have a, every position in it. What positions are elected, and you have supported ones, but the major positions are all elected, right? Uh, there's levels to this shit, and there's levels to democracy. The, the United States is less democratic than a, a lot of uh, Western European social democracy. So, you know, like our union, the Teamsters, is probably democratic, more democratic than most unions. We get to elect our, we have a direct act election of our international officers. But we still have to vote, you know, have delegates, we still have to do the nominations, and they're trying to make it more difficult for reformers to run by uh, changing the amount of delegates they gotta get in the convention from 5% to 10%. So, but, but still, it's, it's a representative democracy. You know, in this country, like for example, our government, we have a representative democracy. But you know, the, the elected officials don't represent the people. They, you know, they don't represent their voters. They represent their donors. And just like um, in the union, it's a representative democracy. What we need is direct democracy. The more members are active and involved in the union, the better it's going to be. The more, more rep like for example, we elect four of our business agents also in our local. A lot of locals don't have elections of business agents. We get to elect, you know, some of our stewards, but, but you know, they were appointing stewards in our local in violation of our bylaws. So instead of doing it correctly, they just changed the bylaws so they get a, a, a point more of the stewards. So the problem, is, the argument that they give is that they have elected stewards. It's it's a popularity contest, and the the, uh, the company can have a say what happens. And I guess there's some threat of that. But when they're appointed by the union officials, 
they're going to be yes men for the union officials, and what they're going to do is sell concessionary contracts to the members. That's been my personal experience. I was removed for, as when I was appointed for organizing a vote, no. So then when I got elected, I got myself in a position where they couldn't remove me. But most, most stuff are appointed. Most of the uh, uh, stewards are appointed. Most of the business agents are appointed in most locals. Our bylaws give us four elected business agents out, out of a local. Where I don't know how many business agents, but you know we have 15,000 members, and we got a lot more than uh, four business agents. The, the uh, Postal Workers Union asked no. me to be a union steward, and I, I said no you. because I don't want to represent a lot of guilty people. A lot of people are guilty, aren't they? Well, you could say that if you want, but who's more guilty? I mean, the companies are, is, uh, there's levels to this stuff, right, are exploiting our labor. The employers are exploiting our labor, making us work harder and faster. So, I mean, you know, I'm on the side of the working class. No, hey, nobody's perfect, but you know it's like. But I'm on the I'm on the side of the workers, and you know I was a union steward, and it was a very unthankful job. You know maybe I'm partial to it, but I think that's the hardest job you can have because you have to do the physical labor of the job and also do the representative of the members. Now remember, they got to do hard work, but they're just doing the work. A union official got to represent the members, right? It's intellectual work but they're not doing the physical labor. So the union steward is the hardest job. You're fighting for the members. You know, a lot of the people are, a lot of people are, tend to be ungrateful. Yes, please. A lot of people, you spend a lot of your time representing the same people who aren't perfect, you know, and, um, you know, and, and it's, a, it's, it's a hard work, but, you know, you know I, I took that job on, you know, to stand up for the members who, who, who stand up to organize good contracts, to internally organize the members and stand up to the company, stand up and fight back. But yeah, I mean, if, if you know, a lot of people, you know, get into those positions because they're opportunistic. And if your heart's not into it, no, don't become a, don't become a steward because it's hard, ungrateful job. All right, <laughs> I'm sorry. Who else has a question? Uh, no. Okay. If we have no more questions, Andy, can you get us yeah. started under the rebuttal process, please? All right, let's thank the speaker. Yeah. Brother Joe, excellent job, by the way. Thank you. Now we're, we're going to have, look up here. Oh, Andy, please take the rebuttals over. You'll get the last word, Joe. Thank you very much. Okay, our speaker will get the last word. Uh, so let's have a show of hands. Who would like to give a rebuttal tonight? <laughs> Keep your hands up. We'll get a count. One, two, three, four. Five, six. Anybody over there? So that's seven people. Okay. Everybody gets four minutes. From the time we got now. So the speaker will get the last word. Come on up. Who's first? All right. And we will be timing, so, you know, just... You don't have to take the whole four minutes if you don't want to. I'll take that long, but uh, this is related. Uh, there's a forecast of Trump storms beginning the new presidency coming to office. Uh, this is forecast by put out by the National Political Weather Forecast. Early in January, should see continued stable conditions with high probability of responsible government. But by the third week, however, look for a giant hot air mass moving across the continent of the U.S bringing with it large cumulus clouds with extremely unsettling conditions. Beginning, beginning in late January and early February, we're predicting heavy snow job blanketing Washington. The previous forecast of renewed American greatness will be likely to result in only severe periods of deregulation and significant tax cuts in higher elevations. Congress will experience higher than normal levels of Republican hypocrisy. This in turn will provide Peru's Democratic cold front and so in frosty conditions in both the House and the Senate. Be prepared for a frequent outburst of corporate coziness accompanied by disingenuous proclamations of patriotism. The Supreme Court will be flooded by right-wing appointments, leading to increased inequality, decreased democracy in most regions of the country. Throughout January, February, we're expecting severe Trump storms 
featuring significant outbreaks of gratuitous tweeting. <laughs> With early March, look for pop probability of pontification to consistently remain above 75 percent. This metric will not be confused with the probability of prevarication, which will peak in super saturated levels in excess of 100 percent. Our long-range forecast for March calls for a repeated persistent acid rain, perhaps as long as 40 days and 40 nights, and a slight chance of apocryphal form storms. Despite significant coastal flooding and continued unsettled water patterns, the terms global warming and climate change will be henceforth be replaced with the expression new climate, 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 climatic driven business, business opportunities. As usual, April will bring more storms. The resulting heavy fog in Washington will make it more difficult to see if any progress in swamp draining has been carried out. This year, spring showers will not be followed by rainbows. Instead, current meteorological cultural conditions suggest the appearance of something called white bows. As a consequence, look for significant high pressures of blacks, Hispanics, and gays communities. For experience an early hot summer and repeated outbreaks of inflamed rhetoric and torrid narcissism. Dramatic turbulent political weather forecast throughout the U.S. will likely have negative effect on foreign meteoro meteorology. And with the higher incidence of colliding front, cold fronts and storm clouds forming on the horizon, our agency will continue to monitor the national global meteorological situation. However, we see little chance of calmer weather patterns in the near future, particularly given the current wind winds and limited possibilities of the White House immigration occupancy. Need a weather man in the Thank you. Who's next? It's the same okay. issue. <laughs> right after the war, the hot war in Europe, around 1948 or so, the first thing that the uh, corporations wanted to do is not only have a Cold War with Russia, but also get rid of the most militant aspects, the most militant people in the labor movement. And what they were doing is putting up people that agreed with the Cold War, and they would send them out to places like Italy and South America. Now in Italy, the communists had a very big, um, had a real big thing as far as the Second World War was concerned. And they fought the Nazis pretty hard. And what they wanted to do was get rid of the communists in the labor movement in Italy. And also, like I said, in South America. So they sent out these class collaborators in order to do that. And some, sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. But whatever happened is they got rid of them in the United States, the communists, they were in the labor unions, and they put in people that agreed with the Cold War. So uh, it started off right away after the Second War, World War was over. Another thing, if we look at slavery, if we go all the way back to Rome or Greece where they had outright slavery and eventually that developed into feudalism and in feudalism the, the uh, lord of the manor had the workers given a small plot of land and said that's yours but you have to work for us the rest of the time. So it, w it wasn't really getting rid of slavery, it was just a different form of slavery that they got rid of. Now, under capitalism, we have what they call wage slavery. In other words, a worker might work eight hours a day, maybe three or four of those hours he supported himself. And the rest, what they call surplus value, that is the wealth that was produced, went to the capitalists. 
So even now, we got a form of slavery that people don't really understand that it is slavery. They think we have freedom. And when, they, when the capitalists talk about freedom, what they're really talking about is freedom to exploit the workers and to get and to get the most the most labor out of them without paying them very much. And of course, they went to overseas to get the cheap labor, especially in the third world, where they can make super profits, tremendous amount of profits. And that's what they're trying to do right here in the United States now. During the Second World War, they needed the workers to side with them against the Soviet Union. But now, there is no Soviet Union, and they didn't have to do that. So what they do is exploit to the maximum. And they have what they call contingent labor. That is, you go to work whenever they call you in. Like they need you in the morning for two hours, then you have to go home, and you don't know if they're gonna call you the rest of the day, but if they do, they'll call you in for another two hours. So the slavery is getting more pernicious, and it's exacting more surplus value and more profits. And that's all they're after. When they talk about freedom, what they mean is freedom to exploit, freedom to go other countries, get cheap raw materials, cheap labor, and to have markets. I remember I went to Mexico about a year after I got married, it was 1962, and if you went to buy anything in Mexico, it was all made by the United States, most of it. Your toothpaste or your soap or whatever you have was made in the United States and was sold there for markets. That's what happens. So now, there, the capitalists in the situation now, like for instance, if you go over to Asia and they make a pair of gems for somebody, the gems cost them approximately a dollar and a half and he might sell it for $150. And uh, what happens is, of course, they need middlemen to sell it, and they need people to advertise and so forth and so on. So the uh, money that they make is a little less than that, but still the exploitation is fierce, and they make more and more profits. But the system has got to a point where I think you're going to have a deep depression in the United States because nobody really has the money to buy back the goods that are produced. And the people in the third world don't have the money. So what they do is try to make as much money as they can on each item. But at the same time, they're building up a situation where they won't have customers no more because they're, they're paying people so little they don't have the money to buy anything. So you're going to have a big depression that will make 1929 look like a tea party. Uh, the Tea Party people will support you. Yeah, that's all right. Well, uh, in, in response to what, what your your rebuttal speech earlier, all I would say is that you don't need a weatherman to know the way the wind blows. <laughs> now, um, look, I asked Brother Joe here about the um, significance of May Day. Uh, you know, years ago we used to have this this play that we put on here at the College of Complexes. Uh, uh, you know, when May Day came around. Today's May fifth. Uh, so May Day was four days ago. Um, now, how many of y'all know that May Day actually started right here in Chicago? Oh, yeah. oh yeah, that's right. Okay, we've got some hands. Does anybody does anybody know how how the whole May Day thing got started? Anybody? Yeah. No. Okay. Like for the eight hour day. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, what happened? Police riot. Yeah, yeah, and, and, then, and that was on May Day, right? May Day was it 1886. Yeah, right, right, and three, like three, a couple of days later, they had another protest and so on and so forth. Yeah, right. Okay, and they ended up putting some men on trial who were uh, who were uh, labor organizers, and they accused them of the, well, I don't know what terrorism or something, and because uh, somebody threw a bomb and, and 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 killed several policemen. Nobody knows who did it. But anyway, they, and these guys ended up um, ended up being sentenced to death, and they ended up hanging. Uh, except for uh, I think one one of them committed suicide in his cell. Uh, exploding cigar. What? Exploding cigar. Exploding. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, now one of the men, one of the Haymarket martyrs, and that would happen right here in Chicago. 
Um, Randolph? Yeah, Randolph and Des Plaines, Haymarket Square. Now, one of the Haymarket martyrs was a man named Albert Parsons, a former, uh, um, a Confederate veteran of the Civil War who had married a woman of mixed African American and Mexican ancestry named Lucy Parsons. And after his death, Lucy Parsons went on and, and continued uh, working in the labor movement. And in the year 1905, she, along with, with Big Bill Haywood and Mother Jones, founded an organization called the Industrial Workers of the World, the IWW, the Wobblies. And, and what, what city did that happen in? Chicago. Chicago. Oh my God, it happened here in your Chicago. Yeah. And, and there was, there was, um, the Wobblies used to often speak at a park on the near north side of Chicago. And, and this was a, what was it, like a weekly occurrence, I think, in the, in the warm weather, um, in the summertime. Uh, and, 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 you know, it was a freedom of speech forum. Guys would stand on soapboxes and give speeches, and they tend to get heckled a lot. And what was that called? What was did, Charlie? You know Bug the name House of that? But yeah, Bug, Bug, oh, that's right, Bughouse Square, and that was right here in Chicago. Washington Square yeah. Park. Yeah, Washington, Washington Square, Square Park. Park. Okay, and a guy, somebody got the idea of, well, you know, we can't do this in cold weather. Why don't we have it indoors in the winter time? And so they started having it at a place on the near north side called Dill Pickle Club. Now. There was a man who was a member who was the, actually he was the janitor at the he was the cleaning guy at the Dill Pickle Club and he also was a member of the Wobblies. And anybody know that guy? And and he decided to start his own group in 1951. Well, that's right, Slim Brundage. And what was the name of that group he founded? College of Yeah, that's right. That's right. So there's a connection between us and Haymarket. And we're we're the descendants of the Haymarket. We're the spiritual descendants of the Haymarket martyrs. Right here. All right. Okay. You going? That's <laughs> audience participation. Right. Introduce yourself one last time for those that don't know. Hi, I'm David Zucker. I'd like to thank Brother Joe for a very inspiring and interesting oh. talk. Um, first, you're all lucky that I'm not. Gene the Mad Monk who shows up here. Uh, Otherwise, I would begin this talk with dear friends of Slim Brundage. And since I'm not Gene, I will say that I'm happy to corroborate much of what Brother Joe was talking about. Because last night, I talked with a friend of mine who does not, not come to the college, no, do not know, who was a mechanic for many years for the CTA. But he also worked at one point for UPS where he had a job cleaning out the trucks, fueling them, and, uh, and so on. And he had to get done so many trucks in a specified period of time. And it just about drove him nuts because they were very tough on the number of trucks that they wanted done within a specific time. And in addition to all of that, he was expected to use essentially just a brush to do this. So, and I got the impression from talking to him that, yeah, this is quite correct. That they do run their business like, like a freaking slave ship. You can just imagine, instead, a Roman galley sitting down there with the recalcitator, or whatever he was called, cracking the whip. So, you won't, you couldn't pay me to take a job there. No way, no how. And finally, I told this joke before. So I'm going to ask your forbearance. Now, once upon a time, there was a meeting in Moscow during the days of the Soviet Union. And there was an important party conference going on. And this, uh, all the big shots were there. Uh, Khrush Khrushchev was there and so on. And finally, somebody, they, they, the chairman took questions. And finally, one questioner stood up, comrade chairman. What is the difference between capitalism and communism? I'm glad you asked that question, comrade. That's a very good question, a very important question. Under capitalism, man exploits man. Under communism, it's the other way around. Right. Wow. Hey. <laughs> hey. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> you, you know, Brother Joe, you bring up a really good point on a lot of this, uh, you know, union versus uh, management stuff. And it almost seems like we've been through this before. If you look back at the 19 teens and the 1920s, are you familiar with, with the state of labor and management back then? Same it is now. Uh, Same it is now. We uh, sometimes see history repeating itself. And what eventually I think got around to clearing that out was the Sherman Antitrust Act and some of the other uh, things that the federal government used to get rid of a lot of the uh, monopoly corporations. But at the same time, those very monopoly corporations spread something called globalization, which has basically benefited the world with the flow of trade, money, and goods around the world, causing price reductions, and causing, frankly, the standard of living around the world to go up over time. Yes, we do need unions. Yes, we do need corporations. But what we don't need are people saying that globalization and capitalism are bad. Because they're not. They're not? They're not bad, Charlie, because they've delivered the goods for the last 300 years. Yeah. They brought, the, they brought yeah, abject the poverty. Front. They brought abject poverty from the field and brought people into the cities to uh, how about we put it this way? We were able to make carbon our slave instead of people our slave over the last 300 years through industrialization. We've been able to improve lives because of mechanization and the development of basic things like electricity, electric power, and other, and, and, and now with the internet. You know, the Teamsters can organize a campaign now through email, Facebook, and every place else a lot faster than they could even 10 or 15 years ago when they had to use like mail and everything else. No, you still have to have the presence of a person on the on the floor, on the uh, on the workplace floor. You still have to have a person organizing the gates. That doesn't change. What has is the methodology of communication to make it move much, much quicker around the world. Yes, I like what I'm seeing in the world today. I like seeing that globalization and uh, capitalism are expanding around the rest of the world. I like the fact that we're starting oh, to see right. I like the fact that we're starting to see the rest of the world globalize. When you're ready. No, I don't like some of the exploitation that these large corporations give, but there are remedies. And, you know, I, what I really particularly like about Brother Joe is he's one of those guys who's taken a stand kept with what he's been believed in all these years, and stood for the slave ship corporation. Now, what does happen, though, too, with these large corporations is they have customers. I work with UPS almost on a daily basis with the people at their call centers, with some of their sales reps, because we ship an awful lot of goods through UPS from my workplace. And believe me, they are very responsive to us. But yet even we as small business that I'm with have problems with the same company because of policies and other things, rate increases. We think sometimes uh, some, of the, some of the stuff we're charged is just outrageous, uh, mistakes made in cargo handling. There's a ton of stuff that, that goes on. But for the most part, we use them because they're reliable. We have less than a, a, there's less than like a 1% problem with anything they do. And for the most part, they're pretty decent company, at least from the small business perspective. We figure their rates are a little bit higher than they'd like to be, but you pay for what you, you get what you pay for. Thank you. Who's next? All right. I'll take the next rebuttal here. It won't be that long. Um, some of those, those of you that have heard my talks in the past know that uh, the media maintains Americans in a bubble of mythology and ignorance. People in America believe things that aren't real. 
compared to other companies around the world. And I saw nobody mention a popular myth that was reinforced here tonight, the fight for 15. Fight for 15 as if that were a living wage. It's not. In Chicago, $15. If you're a woman with one child and a paid for car and you're homeless, living in a homeless shelter, you can't get out of a homeless shelter and rent an apartment anywhere in Chicago and support yourself on $15 an hour. The Chicago the Sun Times published an article that said it takes between $18 and $22 an hour for a woman with a child to get out of a homeless shelter and support herself. $22 an hour today is comparable to the minimum wage in 1962. $22 an hour. 15, the fight for 15 is fighting for two-thirds of a minimum wage. Now, how many people mention that when in the fight for 15? Not many. 1973, a banner year, Lewis Powell, who became a Supreme Court Justice, wrote his famous Powell Memo. Well, 1973 is what, 45 years ago? 44, 45 now, right? Powell said, basically, uh, it went out to the Chamber of Commerce, Better Business Bureau, and uh, influential corporate heads. He said, democracy is beginning to get out of hand. Middle class people are, uh, you know, the middle class is growing, and pretty soon, they're going to be able to have a majority and vote for living wages for people, better health care, better housing. The middle class has been growing steadily since 1945, and that's not going to be good for corporate billionaires. We have to start funding media. You've got the Cato Institute, the Heartland Institute, uh, all kinds of these think tanks that were funded to promote the alternate view. And Powell said, middle class people and poor middle class people have accumulated too much wealth. We have to start taking it back. And 1973 was the year that the war on the middle class really began. And then it picked up speed when Ronald Reagan was installed in 1980. And we had the myth of trickle down economics. Well, everybody know what trickle down on the heads of the middle class and the poor. And then Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton, in my opinion, was one of the finest Republican presidents ever elected, and elected as a Democrat. He ran as a Democrat, but he set the stage for the eight years of unparalleled corporate crime of the Bush-Cheney administration. The Bush-Cheney administration transferred more wealth upwards into the bank accounts of billionaires in, in, in the shortest amount of period of any time in the history. And now, the Trump administration is handling all the regulations they are setting the stage for another huge transfer of wealth and another mini recession or uh, might be a bigger recession. And our own military, bless them, our own military says that the greatest threat to America is not terrorism, it's climate change. And they're looking at Houston and Miami as being flooded out every other year now. Would you want to live in a zone where you get 10 feet of water over your house every other year? That's what it looks like in hurricane season with these once in 25,000 year floods with you know 60 cubic miles of water coming in shore over 2,000, 3,000 square miles in these massive hurricanes because the ocean is just one degree warmer. This is where we are, people. And you can learn these things and learn the solutions and what's going on all over the world simply by spending five or ten minutes a day looking at common dreams for truth out. Those two websites post the best of the best of what's going viral all over the place about what's happening. And for incidentally, those of you that don't know what happened last Saturday night while we were sitting here, Michelle Wolf gave one of the greatest roasts of the, uh, the correspondence dinner in the history of that dinner, and she's being used as an example, of, like our speaker talked tonight about how to speak truth to power, how to speak truth to power right in their face. That's what we have to do. The time, as Paul Friedman said, everybody's worried about offending people. 
we, we don't want to offend anybody and be politically incorrect. He said, well, it's time to get out there and offend some people. And that's where we are. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Charlie Bottle, who's next? As you, uh, Charlie. Wrap Charlie. All right. Charlie. All right. Charlie. Let's, uh, let's Charlie's give a hand to my brother Joe. Yeah. Happy May Day, everyone. Uh, let's see, I'll be eclectic as usual there. I think um, the teams are still come under the the rules of transportation, if I'm correct, uh, which are a little bit different. They, they, the lineage of that goes back to the railroad, railroads, uh, which have their own unique history and the elections and labor law is a little bit different when you're in the transportation uh, thing. That's what I mean. Um, I know their elections are a little bit different. Um, for many, many years, and I still do this, I negotiated contracts and also engaged, a lot of people don't realize this, is you, you have ongoing negotiations for changes in the conditions of employment. And there can be any number of those. Uh, so, uh, changes in departments, changes in whatever level of the company or organization. Some can be nationwide, some could be just like one of your facilities you have. Uh, a, you know, a manager comes in and wants to do things so you have to negotiate it and look it up. Uh, the one thing about these big contracts are they're very, very complicated documents. Uh, the, they're not negotiated in isolation. Uh, there's other industries, similar industries, employees of other industries you have to research. There's current case law. Uh, yes, you'd like to be expansive in the contract. Can you be, there's trade-offs. Uh, you know, and I, and I will say there, there are good negotiators and there's bad ones, like anything. I must admit there have been a few occasions when I came away from the table with not much, and I'm one of the best. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Say it. You put together a negotiating team. Sometimes you put together, for, like if you were talking your elected or appointment, sometimes people get appointed to negotiating teams for political reasons. So they don't really put in any time and effort into it. They don't know what's going on. Uh, you actually have an odd number. If you're really doing it the way it's supposed to be done, you have an odd number of people on your team so that votes come up. Do we accept this? Are there trade-offs? Do we get eyeglasses for free versus something for, it's sometimes it's weird. You end up at the end sometimes with half a dozen or a dozen things and you try to craft a deal. It sometimes has to be created. You have to, you have to know the art of negotiations. You have to write a middle ground. You gotta craft language in that. So it's an interesting area. I, I certainly enjoy it and uh, you know, it, Every every one is a little little different. Uh, now the other thing is, and you might have been I'm a little critical because contracts are complex documents, and I think you even heard from Joe he has his priorities, but are his priorities the same as let's say some other employees? I think job security personally is the number one priority. It more you can do that, you know. Uh, and ensure that, like you, you're creating your 10,000 jobs. That's a, that's great. I mean, uh, now, what did they have to trade away, perhaps, to get that? I don't know. It may have been an expensive bargain, um, or maybe they had tough. Maybe they just, you know, they wanted through the strike. You know, that's there's different ways. You know, but all right, uh, that's basically it.
thank you for your efforts in the organized labor movement. You know, uh, I, I, I like the Teamsters. I've often aspired to be a Teamster boss myself. And if you come to my office downtown, I have a copy of this video of the movie called Teamster Boss, and that's who I am. Yeah. And you're telling me about your grievance. Well, the Teamster Boss will decide. No, there's all kinds of things that go on in regarding grievances. He, he, he knows his stuff. He said that the union owns the grievance procedure, and they can administer it. And they decide which way it goes. Now, I have not, I have even had disputes with my headquarters regarding how grievances are handled, how they, how they're pursued, what, 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 you know, settlements are along the way. They said, who's doing it? Mm -hmm. Stuff like that. It's not a, it's not a, 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 a you know, a word that's that precise very often. There is a modus, your own opera organization as its way of operating, you know. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot, Joe. We'll see you All next right. year. That is, unless you, you end up in the... Uh, uh, yeah, they're going to they're gonna take care of you, Phil. He may. Yeah. But I got moves. Yeah. Thank you for the update, Charlie. And our speaker has the last word. All right. Joe, when you're done, just take that gavel and gavel us out next to it, okay? Okay, uh, okay uh, one of the things uh, that I was talking about is uh, you know, uh, capitalism provided this, that, and another. Yes. And, and that's not the case. It was our labor that did it. I mean, we could have had a different type of economic system, you know, and still created these different things. It could have looked a, a lot of different ways. You know, you talk about all this technology. I mean, you didn't talk about it today, but I mean, I'll use the cell phone. I mean, no right. offense, but you went on and on about the wonders of the cell phone that was created through capitalism. No, it was, it was exploited labor. You know, had uh, people diving out of, uh, you know, they had to put up nets because people were jumping out of the buildings and committing suicide because the working conditions were so terrible. It was labor that created all, all wealth. Labor preceded capitalism, therefore, it deserves the highest regard. And that wasn't Karl Marx that said it was Abraham Lincoln. You know, so it could have been, you know, it, you know, it's just different technology, right? You know, that's created, it was created by labor, and it could have came under a different economic system. I'll use, it for example, these wonders of modern technology, like at UPS. Uh, they, put, they used to have rollers, and you put it on the rollers and push it out. And then they changed it to extend those. Basically, your belts that are sucking the packages out, all you got to set them on the belt, and it shoots off. And they say the person can unload more packages, but how does that really benefit them? They're actually lifting and unloading more packages, so it might make them easier to unload an individual package, but they're doing a lot more. But even if it's easier for him, it's not easier for the next guy that's scanning it, they're coming faster, they're not easier for the, for the guy who's sorting it, it's coming faster, and it's not easier for the guy that's loading it. So it sped up, when these extendos came in, they usually take an hour to unload a truck. Then it went down to 45 minutes. Now it's unload each truck. So uh, production was sped up, you know, 25 percent. Did, did they get a 25 percent increase in the pay? Did they even split the difference? Yeah. No, not. They just work faster and harder. So I mean, I'm all for the, the technology, but it shouldn't be used for us to be able to work less hours and have more leisure time and get with no loss of pay. You know, so we get paid the same amount for working less hours. But that's not how the system's set up. They have less people working. You know, working so then, then there's more unemployed people. So then the, they pay less for the job because people are more desperate to work. The, the more productive you are, the, the, the lesser value of your labor per item you do. Uh, so that's one of the things I wanted to address. Now the fight for 15. I wanted to address that. Right, 15 is not a living wage, but there's a movement uh, for 15 because of the fight for 15. Millions of people around this country have has increased. You know, their, uh, their wages, you know, it went up and they're less miserable. But yeah, um, you know, the a living wage would be 20 something an, an hour and then we need to fight for it. But, you know, even, even you know, look, these are reforms worth fighting for. But even, we have to fight for stuff that even not to be a living wage. So that, that shows how unfair and how unjust the system is and it needs to be abolished, you know. And 
I mean, I like the comments, you know, people are talking about slavery. Um, right, uh, somebody talked about earlier, you know, basically, you know, uh, if anybody, uh, 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 I forget what this is exactly called, but it's, uh, it's a mental thing. When, when, um, when uh, it's uh, some of the conversation uh, energy, but anyhow, it's like, say if you got water, right? And when you freeze water, it gets cold. And it, it, it freezes, right? It, it changes what it is. If you heat it up, it, it, it changes what it is. If it changes this degree in temperature. So eventually, you know, uh, quantitative change can become a qualitative change. And exploitation of labor can get to the level of slavery. I mean, what we got in this country is way slavery, but it just, the change, the, the form of exploitation just has changed, the form and degree of the exploitation. You know, uh, one and the same. Oh, and one of the issues I did have, though, is the, the term middle class. There is no, there is no class called middle. That, that's a, a fabrication, and that's my pet peeve, yeah. fabrication used in the United States to, to destroy class consciousness of people and think that somebody who is in the working class, you know, has the same interests as somebody in the petty bourgeoisie. You know, and, and, you know, so there's no class called middle. I mean, there might be a middle income, but there's working class, there's the place in the middle is the petty bourgeoisie, you know, the managers, uh, the, the owners of small business, small landlords, and then there's, you know, the own, owner of capital that owns the factories, you know, the, you know, the own, owns everything. So, you know, that's my little pet peeve, and, and that's a term that's used, you know, to, you know, to brainwash the working class of uh, this country. And what, else, uh, what else can I say? Uh, okay. Uh, well, okay. And um, so we're uh, on, on uh, the, the last one is um, about, about trade-offs and contracts. You know, see, I mean, that's, uh, no offense, but a lot, a lot of the union officials, you know, say you got to trade something to something. It, it's all a matter of power. If you have the power, if you win the contract, it, initially, the gains in the, in the uh, contract negotiations was first people formed unions and made gains. I mean, their conditions were so miserable, they had nothing else to give. So they made gains. You have a union, unions, you, the reason you have a union is to advance, you know, better your wages, better your uh, working conditions. You know, not to go backwards. Is that it? No, oh, pretty much. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Have a look, Andy. Okay. Thank you all for coming, and we're adjourned for tonight. We'll see you next week. All right. All right. Okay. I don't know. Did you still watch that?